I'm Wendy Smolin, and I'm... That was my, that was my boss. Uh, so everybody should clap here. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to see all these incredible faces in the room, and we're honored that you've decided to join us because, you know, there's lots and lots of conferences out there, but we feel that this one has such an incredible depth to it, and you guys are what makes it special. So I also want to thank um, our sponsors because they also help make us special. And I also want to make, do a special call out to MIT who, and Scott Osterweil, who has been here with us throughout the entire process, including coming in on his bike this morning at 5.30. So be nice to him because if I were him, I'd be cranky. Um, we, I, one quick housekeeping announcement, uh, two actually, there's a coat rack outside opposite the elevators, which is also where the bathrooms are. Um, and um, the other one is, if anyone is on a panel, please um, go see the AV people like five minutes before the end of the speech before you so that you can get mic'd up. And now, so that we stay on schedule, um, I'm gonna introduce RJ Miguel, who is the head of, the director of games. Um, for Google, and when he, when I said to him, okay, how do you want me to introduce you? He said, well, tell them I'm awesome and humble. <laughs> so that should give you just a sense of his sense of fun. So here we go. Hi everyone, that's me, RJ. <laughs> And I'm going to open this conference today for you by giving you some of my reflections on where things are going with augmented realities and, and in particular how it, it ties into entertainment and, and gaming. We, we often talk about games as some sort of special specific thing, but I end up lumping entertainment into that because for me it's, it's much bigger than just games. It's, it's the things that we do to amuse and engage ourselves and engage one another and it's more than just games. It is a kind of entertainment. I, I, I call the World Wide Web entertainment. Every time it's, you know, okay, every time it's four o'clock in the morning and I've got three dozen tabs that I still haven't even gotten to yet because I've just been browsing for hours and hours, I'm really enjoying myself and I, I think that's really, that's part of the process of what's going on here. So I'm gonna to talk today, you guys don't mind if I walk with this, do you? I'm not good at standing still, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna to talk today about these things. I'm gonna talk first about love because I think that's what's really driving this and I, I think that's what's really behind what we do one way or another. And I, I wanna talk about what's actually going on right now, this whole next revolution that's underway right now and it's, it's actually called the second revolution as I'll explain. And I think that in, in terms of everything that we're doing and, and where the future is going, as we've seen with our mobile devices, it's, it's become a mobile world, it's becoming this different kind of a world that's not, this keeps dropping out, is it? Okay, I think they're getting a new one. And, and that we are shifting into more and more of a mobile space and, and further and further away from the kinds of computers that are tethered to the wall and instead where we get to walk around. Check. Check. Okay. Thanks. Where we get to walk around with them and, and, uh, and have them with us all the time, everywhere we go and everywhere we are. And finally, I'm gonna end with a few reflections on what I think is really going on here. You hear a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and, and Google happily, we don't think of it as AI anymore. We think of it now as machine intelligence because in, in my opinion, this is where it really needs to go. It's not artificial in any real sense, but in the sense of creating a new kind of intelligence, a new kind of consciousness, as I will explain. But let me start with love. Because I think, you know, this is, this is basic to human nature. This is who we all are. We all want to be loved. We all want to be connected. We want to be able to be with one another and, and, and to be able to be in touch with each other and to expand and, and to grow beyond who we are into new horizons of new people that we get to meet. 
And we have the technology that is empowering us to do that. The, um, uh, I, I feel that, that you know, if you look at it, if you look at what's happened with the technology over the last 20, 30 years with computers, it's all been aimed at that. It's all been aimed at finding ways to connect us with each other and bring us together with, with each other. The launch of email alone just created a way where we could send letters to each other where the other person would get the letter a minute later rather than two days later or whatever. And, and it, it created that constant uh, advancing of, of being able to hook up with each other and, and to have more richer, more profound relationships with each other. And I think it really is because that's what we want to do, is we want to find ways to be able to connect with one another and, and to, to have a richer interpersonal relationship and all of this stuff that I have listed here. The internet, the television, the telephone. I mean, these are all pieces, examples of technology that are bringing us closer to each other and, and allowing us to have more rich and full relationships with each other. Even, even the alphabet and, and the wheel are, are part of that. But I think it's all of it's driving toward this next revolution that is coming at us right now. I, I, I make the claim that the World Wide Web exists because of games. And here's why. Long time ago, those, if there's any old timers in the room, I don't see that much white hair in this room, but I, I go way back. In the beginning, when, in the beginning, we had computers at work, and we were developing computers for work technology because we needed spreadsheets and word processors and stuff like that. And then we took our computers home because we wanted to work at home. But we didn't work at home, we played games at home. We took our computers home so we could do solitaire and you know all the other games that were out there. And over the years that went by, that playing games at home thing became the more important thing. And, and, and after, after several years, our computers became more than fast enough, more than powerful enough to do all the spreadsheets and all the word processing that we wanted to do. But it didn't stop there. Our computers kept getting more and more powerful and more and more advanced because of games. We got better graphics capability every year, more and more improved audio, rich capabilities with audio, CDs and, and uh, you know, all these other capabilities that came online. And it wasn't because we needed it for work, it was because we needed it for play, because we wanted to be able to enjoy it, uh, enjoy ourselves more. And, and then suddenly, there was this world that was filled with machines, both at work and at home, everywhere. Big, powerful CPUs, lots of RAM, great audio, and superb graphics. And into this fertile ground, out of this fertile ground, sprouted the World Wide Web. And I say that it couldn't have happened unless it was for games, that we made the, the territory, we made the ability for this stuff to come into existence because of our, our craving for entertainment, because of our desire to be able to play with each other and, and connect up with each other. And that the World Wide Web happened because of that. And, and I feel that there's the next revolution is happening right now. It's happening right now in our very pockets. This device that I walk around with now, my phone, quote unquote phone, which is also a video camera and et cetera, it's, it's, um, it's as powerful as a PS2 my device, and, and it, we're all walking around with PS2s in our pockets right now, and, and uh, uh, PlayStation 2 is what I mean by PS2, sorry. And tomorrow it's gonna be a PlayStation 3, it's gonna be you know, as, as powerful as, as the major consoles that are, are being developed, and, and we are able to find other new ways to connect with each other because of this. There's these big changes that are coming. We're, we see, I mean, hardware performance, of course, is going to keep screaming up higher and higher. Although these days I play a game, I put my game, my phone back in my pocket and burns my leg because of the, you know, the heat of the CPU. And that's going to be a problem. That, that the more powerful they become, the more batteries they suck and the more heat they generate. But, but there's all these other things that are coming. Uh, spontaneous networks is one of my favorite ones where we could even have done it in this room if this stuff had existed already today where people that are in a, a big large social setting will create networks with each other. I, I, I call it a fabric network where it's, it's just an interconnectivity that could happen here at this conference, could happen at a rock concert,
concert, could happen at a sports event, something like that, a political rally, where you're able to connect up with each other and create a network where you're able to communicate real time, vote with each other, take pictures. I envision a day where at a rock concert, the entire stadium is filled with people that are networked together and, and so many people are pointing their cameras at the screen at the same time that the, the performers could create a live 3D image of what's going on on the stage and broadcast it to people that couldn't be at the concert or stuff like that. I mean, there's all these new and powerful things that are coming at us. But I think it's all aimed at, the whole point of all of it is social connectivity. It's so that we can play with each other, so we can connect with each other, we can spend time with each other, communicating with each other, and loving one another. I think that not only is the, uh, this next revolution It won't switch. Uh oh, the computer's crashed. I've got the weight symbol. I think that not only are we um, uh, 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 connecting to uh, with each other because of the uh, the increased power, the increased capabilities of the system. And so we just got to wait till it resolves whatever's wrong. Sorry. It's thinking. It's thinking. But I'll, I'll go on because I know what I need to say that it's, it's becoming entirely a mobile world. And, and this is one of the really important and dramatically different things. In, in the old days, we wanted to, if we wanted to communicate with each other, we had to use a, uh, a pen and paper, and then that switched to telephone, and that was much more instantaneous, much more immediate. Yeah, it might be crashed. OK, I'll keep going. <laughs> And that uh, uh, the, the shift to mobile, the, the fact that it's, all of this stuff is happening on mobile devices, uh, we, we went from phones to being connected to our walls with the devices that were you know, tethered to our living rooms or, or our offices, but now it's free and now it's dynamic and it's going to change the very way that we interact with each other. I, 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 there's so many stories you could tell. You guys, I'm sure, have had them yourselves. Where You don't even recognize it anymore. You're, you're, you're going to meet some friends on a Sunday afternoon, and, and you get out your mobile devices, and you text each other to figure out where you're going to meet. 20 years ago, that was impossible. 20 years ago, you had to make all these elaborate, advanced plans and everything, and now the whole world has become this much more spontaneous, much more dynamic sort of an experience. And that's the way of the future, that it's going to become more and more a world where we are able to connect with each other anytime we want. And to have ongoing, fun, play experiences with each other. Oh, yay. I'm up to the uh, mobile. One, yep, that one, yes, thanks. And uh, just a couple of statistics to support that. The, uh, I, I did a little research for this talk, and, the, uh, and the, as you can see here, it's some really astonishing numbers. Kids spend 50% more time online than they do watching television. And the, uh, I used to be worried about that. I've got kids of my own, and I, I was worried about those. The, the kids, they, they were spending so much time talking with their friends, and, and oh my God, I'd walk into the bedroom, and, and they would be doing homework, but have you know five, seven, ten chat windows open, and listening to music, and there's a video game on in the background. And, and I used to be worried about that, but I've talked with several doctors now who say, yeah, don't worry about that. That's, you know, that's just the way that it goes. And, and these kids are getting sharp and smart and socialized in many different ways than the ways that we did when we were younger. But um, uh, this part, and, and the online thing, unlike watching television, uh, television is passive. You sit there with your hands in your pockets. Uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't engage. You don't interact. Everything that's online is about interaction. You're thinking. You're constantly interacting. You're, you're working to uh, dive in deeper. You're communicating with your friends while you're doing it. It's part of that whole social thing that we do now that is the online thing. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, YouTube is their favorite activity, watching videos and, and going out there and finding what other people wanted. And it's, it's a different way of looking at the world. And all of this is happening because of, uh, uh, a lot of it's happening now because of the, where the, the technology is going with mobile. And where it's going next, boy, I've completely lost my time now, though, at this point. I don't know how much time I have left. I'm going to have to trust you guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Uh, we are also, we're shifting away from, uh, from the more standard ways of getting our information with each other and shifting into this augmented reality space. There's a big difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. Virtual reality is the stuff where you, you wear something that takes over your sentence, uh, senses. Augmented reality is, the, is instead something that just adds to your senses. And, uh, and not only will we be able to carry it around with us anywhere we want, but uh, well, the, the day is coming when we will actually be able to embed it in ourselves. And this is something that makes me a, a wee bit nervous. Uh, let me just do a quick survey of the crowd. So imagine that there, there is a day coming when the augmented reality thing, okay, for me, the number one use for augmented reality, I got to admit the number one use, I'm real bad with names. I, I'm at a party, someone's walking across the room, coming up to say hello to me, and I wish I knew that person's name, and with augmented reality, now you know it flashes up somehow into my consciousness, oh, this person's name, and this is the person's spouse's name, and how many children, and how many pets, and the surgery last year, you know, and, and stuff like that. Favorite flowers, you know, whatever, stuff like that. that. That if I were smart, if I were sharper, I'd be able to remember that stuff, but I don't, and I wish I did. And oh my God, I wish I did, because there's nothing better than, than being able to remember something about someone, and, and when you get back together with someone, to be able to recall, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about artificial, I'm talking about me. I wish I could remember it before I started talking with the person, so then we could have a richer exchange when we do. And that, for me, is what augmented reality is about. Not only just connecting into your own personal database, though, as I'm talking about here, to remember you know, your name when we meet again, or something, but much more than that, where, where you have access to the entire internet, where you could have access to all the knowledge, all that's available in human knowledge, through this augmented reality connection. But now I ask you, I would love to have that. I'd love to be able to, anytime I'm trying to remember a math formula, to have it just magically appear in my head because I thought about what the answer was. And it came somehow from the internet into my head. But, you know, in the beginning, maybe forever, in order to do that, at least right now, to, to connect up to that kind of knowledge, we're going to need some sort of physical connector in some way or another. Some way, you know, they, they're trying to connect to our brains from the outside with pads and sensors and stuff like that, but it's, it's very crude. It's going to be very hard to get any detailed information in or out. I'm talking about an actual physical jack where someone could jack into this jack and, and give you the world of information and all of your own personal information and everything else that's out there. But at the cost of of this connector, and so uh, how many of you guys would, would be willing to have that connector to get that kind of information? When, uh, <laughs> there's at least a few. I, I love the idea. My kids think it's the greatest thing. My kids also, they don't care about any of this stuff. They're, my kids are shockingly unconcerned about privacy. My kid said to me once, my oldest said to me, the, uh, I was asking him, but you know, uh, there's, you know, if, uh, privacy is, is a very delicate thing and, and you would have to be giving away a lot of your information in order to get the good stuff that you get back from it. And they're like, yeah, I, we have no problem with that. We want to do that. We want companies to learn who we are and, and what our characteristics are and, and how we interact so that it can give us better, more customized, more tailored information for the stuff that we need. But that physical jack thing is something that really makes me nervous because, you know, once you have a physical jack, then some hacker out there can get in there and hack in and, and hack his way into your brain. And I don't know that I want some hacker hacking my brain. <laughs> but I think I would do it because I want the capabilities that you get from it. I want the glory. I want the ability to have my brain be that much more enhanced than it ever was. But this is where I think it's all going. We, uh, at, a, at, um, 
at Google, they, we've, like, we've started to eschew the idea of uh, artificial intelligence because, I think mostly because of the word artificial. It, it suggests that we, we, we're creating something you know, not real, something not normal. And my personal belief is that we are not going to try to create human intelligence. We're not going to try to create anything like human consciousness. We simply can't. Here's, here's a good explanation why we can't. When, when we came into existence, when we learned about the world, we used our senses to finally understand what the world was, our, our ability to touch, our ability to see and, and smell and hear. When we create computers that will somehow develop these abilities and have these abilities, they simply won't have the same senses that we have unless we bother to go all the way to create an actual analog of a human being that has you know, actual arms and fingers and senses and noses can, that can smell and all of that. We're not going to do that. That's, there's no real reason to do that. Maybe someday later it'll be a novelty that some mad scientist will create. But I, I don't, I don't, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to create human analogs. We want to create technology that has some sort of ability to have intelligence that we can interact with it. And so we're not going to give it eyes and we're not going to give it ears and noses. We'll give it a thing that can smell. We'll give it a thing that, that can see, but it won't be a pair of binocular eyes. It's going to be 10 dozen eyes that look in every direction all at the same time. And it's also going to be stuff like, like echolocation that, that bats use to feel objects without actually being able to see them. And it's going, there's going to be new senses, new ways that this device will be able to understand the world and will be able to interact with the world. And, and that's not human. It's not going to be human. It never will be human. And I think that anyone who thinks that we're striving to recreate human intelligence, that's, that's the wrong direction. I don't even, at Google we talk about machine intelligence instead of artificial intelligence because that's, that's one of the missions that we're trying to undertake there is to find out how to, ways to get our technology to have some ability to have intelligent interactions with us. But I go up, one up from that. I call it machine consciousness. This is my own personal goal in this world, and I, because I think this is where it's really going, for our technology to be aware, to be conscious, to be able to truly interact with us in an intelligent way, but not in a human way, in a brand new way that we've never seen before. And I believe that consciousness, that ability for our computers to understand the, the, our, our, where we are in the world and the context of who we are in our exchanges and all of that, I think this is going to be the really big thing that happens over the next 10 years. It's going to truly change the way we look at the world and the way we interact with the world. And I think this, you know, I, I think it's coming. I think it's coming everywhere that, that we're going to have these uh, agents, these artificial agents, these machine agents, technology agents, whatever you want to call them, that, that are everywhere. And, and sure, they'll be in our cars. That's, that's obvious, you know, traffic and guidance and stuff like that. Although what I want, I don't want just a nav system in my car. I envision a car system that has, that would be the, the analog of a friend of mine sitting in the passenger seat with a laptop that's connected to the internet. And I could ask that friend any question and, and we could talk about anything. And, and not only, you know, where, where's the, the closest bakery because I got to get a wedding cake, but there's a mountain right in front of me. What's the name of that mountain? Can you tell me anything interesting about that? Or... Or, or my favorite example, uh, I'm stuck in a traffic jam, and I just asked my car nav system, get me out of here. And the car nav system went away, and it came back five seconds ago, and it said, sorry, no can do. You know, there's no options. You're stuck. And I've got this, this ribbon of red brake lights spread out in front of me, and I know I'm here for an hour. And the thing just acknowledged to me, you're stuck, boss. You're here for an hour. And then five seconds goes by, and at that instant, what do I want my car nav system to say to me right then? Do I want it to like sigh along with me, tell me a joke, <laughs> offer to you know play some soothing jazz or something, or maybe just shut up, you know, something like that. But whatever, it's an intelligent response. It's a real world response, not just an automated thing. That's what I'm talking about with consciousness, and that's where I think the the whole thing is really going. But boy. There's a lot of steps we got to take before we get there. 
I don't think it's going to be graphics, not right at first. Anyone in the room who plays 3D video games, uh, you'll agree with me that graphics is getting better, but there's no fooling you in any way that you're actually you know, communicating with a human or anything. It's all still clearly very crude and, and far away from being realistic. Speech is getting better, but speech is still far away, and, and we have to do a lot of things, at least in the near future, that are going to recognize these limitations. And I'm looking forward to speech interactions, and th that is getting dramatically better. It seems by the month that's getting better, but I suspect for the, the short term, it's going to be text-based one way or another, either text that we enter or we say something and then it gets converted to text and the system works with text. But these, these devices, these, these technologies are going to become ubiquitous in our lives. They're going to become pervasive in, in every step of our lives where, yeah, the, the medical stuff, there's, we call them task bots. The, the, the bots that have a specific mission to accomplish for you, tell you about your health or tell you how to find that bakery where you got to get the cake that you need. But much better than that is the stuff where you're able to use these agents to make your life better in all of the ways that I have listed here and all the countless other ways, including that moment at the party when that friend is walking across the room and you wanted to remember that the dog's name was Fido. So that's all coming at us rapidly. And for me, finally, back to my original point, this is what I think it's all about. I think it's about enhancing our companionship, our friendship, our connectivity with each other, and supporting that to make our lives richer and, and better. Not just in play, but in everything that I call entertainment. From the connectivity with each other, playing with each other, but also merely communicating with each other. Oh, I got my traffic jam example up there already, but you get the basic idea. So anyway, that's, that was the presentation I wanted to make to you today. I think that the uh, the direction of uh, where it's going with augmented reality is not merely a novelty. I think it's going to, become, going to become part of the fabric of our lives and that this is where it's really heading. This is, I think, the most important part of technology that, that is being developed in the computer science industry today. So I have a, a moment for a couple of questions if anyone would like. I think there's a microphone. Hi, I had a question about uh, your opinion on, as you were ruminating on the Jack scenario, one of the things that that potentially eliminates is the joy of discovery. Like if you instantly knew everything that you wanted to know, the joy of discovery might be eliminated. Take it a step further, do you think it's actually possible to, to envision a scenario where that joy could be replicated? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be pure speculation on my part, but I think so. I, I think that, uh, well, well, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean that actual experiences that people well, have? Take an example, learning to play a particularly difficult piece on the piano. You know, if you simply jacked in and you could play that piece, you miss out on the joy of practicing and finally mastering that piece. But could you take it a step further and the joy itself, that feeling of accomplishment, gets replicated artificially. Oh, excuse me, by machine. <laughs> by machine. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. I, 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 you know, in, in, I have to admit, my, my vision might be a little shallow here because I haven't thought that, and I'm wrong because it's coming, but I hadn't thought that you would suddenly know how to play a piece of music because you had plugged into it. My, my, my vision was more like, you know, I would be able to read the headlines or, or be able to go and learn something about quantum mechanics that I wanted to know. Um, but because for me, like playing the piano is a physical thing where, where there's, there's muscle memory and everything else that's involved in that. It's not just the, the information, the data. But you could easly see a, a world where you, you get, you're even able to download muscle. the muscle memories. And, and in fact, I, I heard of an experiment recently where they, uh, they did it with rodents that they um, were able, not the, it's not the cerebellum, it's, which is a part of the brain that's with the um, long-term memory. Darn, I've lost the word. <laughs> Wish I knew that. <laughs> Any, anyway, that, um, 
uh, the hippocampus, thank you, thank you. And, and they have done some experiments with rodents where they are able to digitally record and then play back muscle memory memories in, in uh, rodents with, with hardware that you plug in and you can take out and put in. And it's a little bit weird because they, they were able to take a, a rat and, and train a rat how to go through a maze and record that in this artificial hippocampus hardware that they had installed and then take it out and the rat couldn't rem remember the rays anymore, put it back in, and the rat remembered the maze very well again. And then they were able to take that hunk of hardware and give it to a rat that had never seen the maze before, and the rat was able to learn the maze much more quickly with, with this piece of hardware plugged into its head. And this is, this is Matrix stuff, you know? <laughs> the, but I think that stuff is coming. You know, I guess the other side of it is that I believe that all of that is coming, that finally we are going to have our technology extend into our lives, extend into our, our very consciousness. And, and the other side of this whole story for me is that I want to be part of that because I want to make sure we do it right and, and we, we do it in the right way for all of humanity rather than let mad scientists, you know, do something wrong with it. Back here, please. You just mentioned a film, and our artists are already documenting this world, something like her, et cetera. So when you come to the place where you and your machine are sitting in your car, <laughs> having a delightful conversation, um, when, because I'm, I'm concerned so much about the humanity piece, about really the distinction in the end um, that you are, you are making an integration, and I'm interested in how you're making a differentiation. Um, because there is still is something unique, and you said it yourself. So I, I'm, I'm very curious about if you're afraid. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, you are afraid of maybe having a jack in your head, but wh what about the whole configuration of society? Jerry Turkle he, from here at MIT, who's you know, a great writer on, you know, came back all the way around again to conversation, to the idea that what we need more than anything is conversation, face-to-face, one-on-one, human. So while I'm always excited about these ideas, I'm curious how you, how you imagine falling in love with your operating system. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I could easily see falling in love with my operating system. <laughs> I fall in love with the drop of a hat, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and I saw that movie, Her, and, and uh, I understood very well that person's dilemmas in that story. But, but you, your, your very question touched on the, the part of it that I think is a saving grace for all of us. There's the humanity that technology will never be able to replace. It's, it's that... that sitting across the table from each other and, and having a, a romantic conversation and where you do just the right thing with your hand at just the right moment and the other person is, feels that energy or feels the communication. Technology is not going to do that for us. I, I, if, if they ever create androids that could recreate that feeling in me, well, then, then I'm in trouble. But <laughs> I can't imagine in my lifetime that they will be able to create that, 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 that the quality of the human-to-human -human communication, the, the touch, the look, the, the exchanges that actually happen. For me, it's just giving me extra information, but it's, it's not taking away any of, any, any of my humanity except my weaknesses, except, you know, the, the stuff where I'm not as powerful. But the, the whole history of human civilization has been involved with trying to overcome our, our shortcomings, our limitations. You know, you, you could say the same thing about the educational system then. Oh, look how smart it makes people versus the good old days when we weren't so smart. And, and people will be saying that as well with, when, we have, when we're augmented with the technology, when our, our brains become augmented in some way. It'll be the same thing. We're, we're constantly growing, we're developing. I think the human race is, is destined to constantly grow and advance and, and, and increase itself. And, and sometimes we do go down dark alleys that we ought not to have gone down, but the, the, the things that we're creating now, I'm not concerned about, except I know that mad scientists are gonna get their hands on this stuff and they're gonna make 
Some interesting things happen in our lives. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, it's hard to imagine the weirdness that we're going to go through with all of this. But then, you know, if you look back two, three hundred years, they, they couldn't have imagined what it would be like to have a telephone and to be able to communicate with each other that rapidly. It, the thought of it would have changed all of civilization as indeed it did. And this is again going to happen. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm super cautious about talking about this kind of technology because we're no longer talking about holding a phone up to your ear, but you know, actually somehow physically connecting with the person. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that, that we'll do the right thing. I'm also confident there will be mistakes and things are gonna be really bad every once in a while, but. <laughs> Yes, and I'm also confident that no matter what we think and no matter what, how we decide in, in certain parts of the world is the right way to behave and the right way to go forward, some mad scientist in some rogue country somewhere is going to do it anyway. And so I think it's incumbent on us to try to stay ahead of that wave and, and to have the right uh, moral, ethic, and legal grounds to proceed with making this stuff become a reality. Oh, wait, one more? One more, okay, thanks. You already got the mic. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, actually, so we're all talking about play, uh, and one of the fantastic qualities of play is the mistake, right? So how do we build mistakes, generative mistakes, into logical systems so that people learn with them? How does that happen? How do we create generative mistakes in the logical systems? Well, first you get a bunch of software engineers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an awesome question, isn't it? Because I, I don't, I, you know, and, and this is actually part of the thing that really does bother me is the thought that, you know, the day's coming when you could download a chess player in your head and, and you could be a, a great chess player. And, and I, I don't like that. I don't like, you know, back to the earlier question about that muscle memory. It's it, that same sort of thing. I like being able to develop the, the muscle memory of, of how to be able to play chess because that's helped me through my whole life. It helped me with my professional career. It, it, it helped me help me raise my kids correctly <laughs> from time to time. I, I did the king move on them, and, and then their mother came along with the queen move, and that one's always more effective. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it, that quality of learning from growing, from developing, from making mistakes and, and and, and it's, it's the same thing for me like a baby learning by flailing its arm and accidentally bumping into a ball. It learns that when its arm goes like this and it hits a, a spherical object, the spherical object rolls away and if it has a certain mass, it rolls this far, so, you know, et cetera. And that it's a thing that you learn, a thing that you develop over time. And I, I don't know enough about the brain, I'm no expert on it, but it seems to me that that's not something you can really just have implanted in your brain, that, that you would have to learn, that you'll have to grow. And so I guess for me, the augmented reality stuff is more an information stream rather than uh, you know, educational or, or, or replacing or, in, uh, in hand, or adding to the abilities that you didn't have before. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut it off, but I'm here for, for the whole conference, so please come and find me. I'd be glad to talk to you about all of this stuff. As you can tell, I rather enjoy it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.